I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Ian Herd uh, of Amplis. Uh, Ian will be telling you all about uh, the versatile uh, production unit. Now, Ian's worked uh, in the North Sea industry for uh, over 40 years, uh, as I understand it. Uh, he was in the shipping uh, business for about five years before joining uh, Subsea Offshore in the early 1980s. And he's worked in various roles in, uh, within the company uh, as general manager. Ian Lynn left uh, Subsea Offshore uh, around about 1998 and joined uh, DSND uh, Subsea and uh, initially as operations director and ultimately uh, appointed MD of that uh, company. He then left there and uh, when they merged with Halliburton uh, and along with a business partner, business partner started their own company, Integrated uh, Subsea Services. Now, this is a small ROV company, I just had a couple of uh, observation ROVs, fairly modest turnover, around 300,000 per annum, uh, and then they sold that uh, sometime later, um, having built up to personnel of around about 500, fleet of 24 uh, vessels and a turnover of £100 million uh, per annum, so some step change there, Ian. Um, Ian then started Amplis Energy Services 2013 and has been working on developing the company ever since, so I guess we'll only find out just how well you've developed that, uh, Ian, so stage is yours. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ian Howard. Um, so this is the, uh, the versatile production unit. We, uh, we've been working on this for a few years. So initially, I'll just run through a little overview of the ship itself, what it can do, how we came about that design very quickly. Uh, a little bit about the commercial and technical advantages as we see them. Uh, other people may see that slightly differently. Um, and then we've looked at the clusters, another uh, similar couple of clusters that Neil kindly asked us to look at. We've been working with Graham and the team at uh, OGTC on that as well. Uh, a little, just one sheet on some economics on it, and, uh, and then the conclusions. So this is a ship, the hull, uh, this is our 200,000 version, 200,000 barrel uh, storage version, 193 metres long by 36 metres beam, accommodation for 70 people of an operating crew of 37, which is significantly less than any conventional FPSO, so obviously that leads to a bit of cost saving. Um, DP, so no mooring at all, DP3, highest standard of DP. We engaged uh, Holder to design the hull, and their, the reason we chose them is their speciality is um, DP vessels, uh, such as the Aurelia, that some of you may know from uh, Technique, and the, uh, they also specialise in tankers. So we wanted a hull that obviously could store oil, but also be very uh, uh, solid, staying in one position on DP. Um, the turret boy here, disconnectable turret boy, is a, a well-proven unit. There's four of these in operation around the world. It uh, comes from a UK company, and they, um, they've got four of these working. The one uh, that's been disconnected and reconnected most times is on the Helix Producer 1 in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is coming up for, I think it's coming up for its 20th disconnection. Um, you can disconnect the boy on these ropes in about four hours in a planned manner and you can reconnect it again in three or four hours by pulling it up using the, the uh, winches up in the turret here. So proven technology, proven hull design. Uh, the process kit has been designed by CAMFA that have done uh, a raft of different process uh, systems for various FPSOs. So it's all proven kit, new new technology. The original idea came from a uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, DP FPSO that we worked on at Subsea Offshore with ROVs back in the 80s called the Shalane. Um, so we, Stuart, my business partner, myself, we always thought that was a good idea. And we were thinking about the North Sea needed. We thought a small, flexible, uh, manoeuvrable FPSO would offer something that's not currently in the market. Um, offloading is a shuttle tanker from the stern. And um, the ship is designed and will be built as an FPSO. Uh, so it'll have a strengthened deck, all the process kit will be modular, we can put these things on and off, uh, so you don't have to go and put all your kit on up front at a project, you can sort of phase your capex, so if you don't need some gas compression, for instance, for three years, you know, three years at a mutually convenient time, we can disconnect the boy, ship can come back to port, pick up a prefabricated module, um, and then go back and reconnect. 
Um, the, this process kit we've got in here is an RC version, so we've designed that for 20,000 barrels per day. We can actually up that uh, significantly on other requirements for uh, other areas of the world. Produced water is uh, treated and then uh, discharged to the sea, uh, 20 parts per million. And produced gas, uh, we use produ produced gas to run the ship's engines. They, uh, they can run on the field gas, which will be run through uh, reformers to up the methane number to make them usable in the, the multi-fuel engines. Or if the field doesn't have gas, we can also run on crude oil, or we can just run on normal uh, marine gas oil. I'm talking about the 200,000 barrel version here. It's got 24 megawatts of installed power, so it's a very powerful ship. Uh, we like to try, if possible, to run the process kit from the, uh, the engine room uh, to save money on living gas turbines on deck. We haven't been able to do that in every instance, but that's our, our goal if we can do it. And the ship's designed uh, that it can stay, we've done modelling on it, and uh, it can sit in hurricane force sea conditions, and it's only using about 30% of 35% of installed power. And again, the same uh, modelling, it will stay offshore 365 days a year, even in west of Shetland. Um, we do ever see a need to disconnect the ship for weather here in the North Sea. Uh, obviously, if there was a client shut down and we wanted to go and pick something else up or there was some operational reason, it's very easy to disconnect the buoy. The buoy stores itself at minus 40 metres, so it's well out of the way, and uh, go back to port, sort out whatever, pick up whatever we need to, and then come back. Uh, as I said, the process, CAMFA, Umberto's here, um, have designed the process for us, 20,000 barrels a day. Uh, on deck, we've had a hold you know, in the various projects we're looking at. Uh, we're doing a paid study for a, a client in West Africa at the moment. We've got a sulphate removal unit. We've got gas injection, gas export. Uh, we'll be running uh, ESPs, so we've got power to run ESPs as well. So there's nothing on any of the requirements from any client we've had that's ever been, that we've not been able to accommodate on the ship. Uh, as I said, produced water is discharged. The uh, ship will be fully classified by Lloyds. You'll see that in a couple of slides. It will be under the new Lloyds FPSO uh, class notation. Uh, so we think um, we'll probably be one of the first ships to get that. Uh, they've taken everything from their various production, offshore installation, everything into one set of rules for FPSOs. And we've been working with them for the last year, and we've already got approval in principle for the the ship under the FPSO, the Lloyd's FPSO rules. Um, and I mentioned previously the, the gas will be used in the engines. Turret, uh, this is the part that disconnects, as you see there. Uh, the standard turret is designed to handle six six inch risers and three control umbilicals. We can, uh, if required, change that. We can go to 10 inch uh, risers, 12 inch risers. So we've had various configurations, but the standard low-cost version is the six six-inch risers, and for North Sea applications, we've never really needed to change that so far. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's proven technology, so nothing new there. That's the ship. Uh, sorry, that's the uh, turret boy disconnected. Um, not a lot to say about that. It's as I say, it's proven technology, works well. The, there's a clump weight here that you can set the depth you want to hold the turret boy at when you disconnect it, uh, and it's dictated by that clump weight. The good thing is, on conventional FPSOs, generally you've got to take the ship out there, you've got to get the mooring system in place, connect that up, and then you put the, uh, the riser system in with a DSV or some sort of construction vessel. After that, we can actually take all that off the critical path. Uh, there's two ways we can do it. Either the, the client just wet stores the risers, and we use the ROV on the ship to connect up uh, the pull-up line and just pull them up ourselves. Or our preferred option would be the boy goes offshore at the same time as the uh, surf, surf kit, and it's installed like that, well off the critical path. So when our ship comes to the field, we've just got to pull the, the boy up into the ship, and it'll take a few hours, and then you're ready to start your uh, commissioning process. So these are the, the North Sea. We've got different models for elsewhere. This was the one we started with, and we thought we. Uh, the marginals in the North Sea, it's 112,000 barrels, 153 metres by 26. Um, same, they're all the same design, just different uh, storage capacities. Um, the one that we're getting most interest in here is the 200,000 barrel. Um, so we've got firm prices to build all of these. We have uh, been through three shipyard pricing exercises um, and focusing on this one 
predominantly again. Uh, we thought we'd have to build the ship in the Far East initially, but the cost of, you know, obviously the, the price crate, oil price crate ring has uh, made shipyard space available, so they're very keen. We've got buyers from Damon here with us today. And, uh, we now look at to build the ship in Rotterdam, so it's much easier for us to manage the, the build, control that, and obviously uh, Damon are part of our alliance now, so we're working them with many integration meetings already with Damon, uh, with Camfa, with uh, Holder and Lloyds, because everybody's probably got a war story about an FPSO conversion that's gone wrong and run three years over and you know, three times over budget. So, so we're trying to avoid that if possible. Um, that's the uh, the bigger ones, the 360,000 uh, barrel ship, 250 metres long, 40 metres beam. So we think we've got the the, uh, the various range here that can cover just about anything in the North Sea for uh, for small pools up to you know, perhaps even early production on bigger fields if, they, if that ever comes about. So as I said, Lloyd's have given us approval in principle. This is a letter from Lloyd's. We spent. Uh, the best part of six or eight months working with their experts on the design. They've been right through it, through the DPE, the hull, uh, the, um, the tanks. The tanks have got thermal oil heating system in them so we can handle waxy oil and keep it whatever temperature that uh, is required. So we spent a lot of time with Lloyds and as I say this is the first uh, sort of time that they've issued this I think but they are happy that providing we keep to the design we've been through with them and build it to that design, then they will approve it under their FPSO class notation. We have an alliance with Technip and uh, Simon's here, so the deal there is that we can offer the client the whole service. Uh, Technip would provide the wellhead, Technip FMC rather would provide the wellheads, the risers, flow lines, manifolds, etc., and we provide the FPSO. So if a client hasn't got a big infrastructure uh, in company, then they can get us to uh, basically do everything for them. Um, Technique, we're also looking at bespoke um, risers to work with a uh, VPU, both in shallow water and in deep water. And um, we're trying to come up with a system, and I think we're pretty near there, that we can move the vessel uh, well to well with a, a riser system and a manifold system that will move with it. And you'll see that in the, in the cluster. So, so that's been a very good relationship for us. Uh, Technique obviously have a raft of uh, experience of what chat this morning about moving reusable flow lines and risers. Well, they've been doing that for 10 or 15 years in Brazil, so they've got a raft of experience of doing that already. So that's been a, an excellent uh, alliance for us. I want to go through all of these because there's a lot of words on here, but um, yeah, the build cost in the VPU is fixed. If you try and do a conversion, there is a risk that once you cut the hull open, anything can happen. You're cutting into an older ship, so that can cause issues. We have a firm build cost, and our shipyards are even offer as a, a cap on the overrun, so it, uh, it means that the uh, company knows the, uh, the cost is capped. Uh, you know, the ship is designed as an FPSO, designed to sit in location, it's got all the proper deck strengthening, it's got the multi-fuel engines, so it's, it's designed and built to do the job it's going to do. It's not trying to take a, a tanker or a donor hull and convert it into what you want to do, is so where you've got to strengthen up the deck, put power generation on deck, etc. Et so, as I say, firm build schedule, we think it'll be about uh, 26 to 30 months to build the ship, that's the schedule we've got. So um, that's a firm schedule again. If you're on a conversion, you know, things can go. I'm not saying they always do, but they can tend to overrun sometimes. Uh, fully classified v FPSO, the, the VPU. Uh, most conversions are uh, not FPSOs to start with, they're tankers. So it's, um, it can be an issue with classification society. Uh, no mooring, as I said, so it saves you the cost of installing the moorings, which can be quite expensive uh, depending on where you're going and the depth. Um, so we, um, we we decided right up front to go for a DP vessel. Uh, we've got 35 years experience in running DP ships and there have been a couple of fairly major mooring system failures in the last few years in the North Sea that have cost insurance companies uh, quite a lot of money. In fact, our insurers told us one of them was the second largest insurance claim after Macondo. So I don't know if that's true or not, that's what he told me. Um, Subsea architecture, we're using the VPU, you can sit right over the wells basically. If you're using a conventional uh, FPSO again, you tend to need a, 
a distance that it will accommodate the, um, the mooring pattern for the drill rig you might be using and the mooring pattern for the FPSO. We don't have any of that, we can just sit right over the well so we can reduce the uh, subsea architecture to a minimum and also the flow assurance issues are, uh, are much easier because we're sitting right above the well. Um, you can move, uh, uh, that's that one up there, it's phase capex, yes, as I was saying, you can, uh, you can plan to um, phase your capex so you can put the basic amount of equipment you need on the deck when we go offshore, first of all, and then come back in after year one, two, three, four, whatever, and add additional modules or take modules off, so it gives you the flexibility to, we call it a bit of a Lego set, but uh, that's, that's what it's designed to do. Um, Again, multi-fuel engines, so on all the fields we've looked at, we, we seem to think we'll be using, or we've worked out, we'll be using about six million scuffs a day to run the ship and the tank heating, etc. Uh, and that generally uses up the, uh, the majority of the gas from any North Sea marginal field, so we think we'll uh, probably eradicate, but definitely uh, significantly minimise any flaring requirements. Um, yeah, as I said, the, the buoy can be installed up front so it saves you on mobilisation costs. The flip side of that is decommissioning costs are minimised as well. So um, it's very easy to get the, uh, the VPU obviously disconnects itself and then we can even take the buoy with us or whoever comes in to remove the risers can take the buoy away as well. Um, so we've got the, the high, you know, we've designed the uh, accommodation to be the highest possible standards for safety and uh, uh, comfort in mind for the, the crew. Uh, again, that's something you can do with the, the um, luxury of a new build. And we've cited the accommodation at the bow of the ship, which will always operate head to weather. So in the unfortunate uh, event that there was an incident, you had fire and flames, they'll be blown away from the accommodation, rather than a lot of conversions that are blown towards it, which is the last thing you want. And of course, you know, the VPU itself is the biggest lifeboat we can get, because if there was an issue, we can press the button, the, the buoy in an emergency situation can disconnect in around about 30 to 40 seconds. So if we see anything developing, um, you know, the, the OIM master will operate the ship on a watch circle basis, red, uh, you know, uh, traffic light sort of system. So green's fine, amber will be keeping a close eye on it, red will be disconnecting. But if something catastrophic did happen, you just press the button, disconnect, and get the ship out of any uh, get ship out of harm's way. Um, and the VPU can move field to field. As I say, we're uh, working with technique at the moment, and having a, uh, a riser system and uh, surf system, an SPS system rather, that can move well to well. And uh, we think that will be a, a very uh, cost-effective way to develop a lot of marginal fields here on the North Sea. So OGA give us, um, again, some clusters to look at. This was, uh, was two, two scenarios in the first one. Um, the first one here, field A, field B, with a host five kilometres between each, very simple for us. The option, it's uh, oil in place, so somewhere at 81 million barrels. Uh, technically, the cover will reverse 15 million barrels and about 18,900 barrels a day in the first year. So we think using the VPU, we can get at least three years economic production out of this, uh, this cluster. Option one would be the VPU just goes, whether if you want to go A or B and just move, you know, so it takes its riser, goes there, develops that, and then it moves up there and develops that. Option two is traditional uh, subsea facilities, manifolds and flow lines, technique, install those. The VPU sits here just as the host and uh, its traditional facilities. Another option may be that uh, the VPU still sits there, but it's extended reach drilling that's used to cut down, minimise the, um, the subsea facilities. Um, scenario two for this was also uh, there's an existing host, a drill centre, and obviously still got field A and B. So what we see here is, again, we could use the, the moving around, you know, as we mentioned the first time, but looking at all of this, we'd get rid of the host, so you'd get rid of that. VPU would sit over the existing drill centre, tie back to uh, field B, which is somewhere 10 col 7 to 10 kilometres away, just using uh, conventional technology, uh, technique flexible flow lines, risers. And you can do the same to field A, uh, or the other option there, as it's only about uh, 3 kilometres, is you could look at extended reach drilling for that. 
So it gives you various options when you're doing the feed to look at the best way to develop this and you reduce your cost by getting rid of this host. Uh, so, and we think with the added uh, production from this, which is another 9,000 barrels a day coming out of this uh, facility here, then we will get six years economic production using the VPU in this development. Cluster 2 was quite a lot of different uh, smaller fields. Um, we had probably a bit the same issue with this field up here, which is 2,000 barrels a day and uh, 20 kilometres away, I think it's <laughs> you had. So we've kind of discounted that unless we go and sit over it. You know, we could do that and just uh, produce what we can and then move on. But we looked at, uh, at these ones and the, uh, the options there are, again, we move around, as I've said previously, and do it uh, as the VPU is designed to do. Or we can site the VPU in the middle here and uh, have five kilometre tiebacks to field T, field S and field P, uh, which would uh, work very well. Or we could also, again, look at uh, extended reach drilling. And we th the first year production here is uh, 32,000 barrels a day. Uh, it's uh, 24 million barrels uh, recoverable and uh, shuttle tanker offloading and all these scenarios, I should have said. Um, and we think we can get three years economic production out of this. This one, which is field R, is a bit more high pressure, high temperature. We have looked at doing that and we can do it. So we'd probably look at that as a, a separate, produce these first, move over here and then uh, look at producing that for as long as we can. Um, economics on the, on the ship, these are all very high level. Um, $125,000 a day probably for the 200,000 barrel ship. Um, crew, 35, third party services, etc. Et another 53, logistics, helicopters, um, supply boats, standby vessels, shore base support, etc. Giving you a total of this. And then some chemicals. These are est obviously estimates we've just used from previous experience. Uh, we do have really much fuel cost because we use the gas from the field. So you're probably looking at about $196,000 a day for the ship, including everything. So if you've got fields, you're getting down towards at current uh, oil uh, rate, you're getting down towards just below 5,000 barrels a day, and we can still make it economic. See, I, never, I didn't go on too long. Really, you said I would rattle on, but I've not. Um, so, why, uh, why should you consider us? Well, you know, minimise the installation and decommissioning costs. As I mentioned, I think uh, a lot of companies, I think the law says you've got to put money in a, an account for decommissioning. Well, if you use the VPU, that's a lot, a lot less money and it leaves you more money to spend elsewhere on your developments where you want to spend it. Uh, we can, you know, our, our model is uh, lease and operate. Uh, we've offered operators all sorts of uh, derivations on that. Some of the bigger operators want to buy the ship, which we're happy to give them the option to do. Uh, some of them want to, us to provide the, the vessel and the marine crew, and they provide the production crew, which again is fine. Um, so there's a lot of different capex, uh, sorry, uh, commercial models we can use on, uh, on how you take the ship. Yeah. Um, minimises opex costs through the produced gas being used for fuel, so that uh, reduces the cost and the fact that our crew is so much smaller, he means the cost of the ship on a day basis is, is less, but also you're using less helicopters, etc., etc., less food. Um, and the, the dual fuel engines get sort of flaring basically, or significantly reduces it. And um, I think that's a, that's a big issue for a lot of these marginal fields, what you do with the gas. So we can handle that. And as I mentioned, flexibility in the capex, so you just spend the money when you need to spend it rather than spending $100 million on some gas compression kit and it's sitting offshore for three years doing nothing until it's required. And you can move the VPU as one of our clients is doing. It's looking at using the VPU in West Africa and then moving it to the Gulf of Mexico. So it can move either field to field, it can move region to region. Uh, it just gives you an awful lot of flexibility and as I say, both in the shallow water and the deep water, we're looking at the option of uh, moving the surf SPS equipment with it, so you just take the whole lot and uh, it's all done by ourselves and Technique FMC. And we've got the ability to offer the complete solution through the alliance with Technique, um, so we can, we can do everything really.
That's it. That is it.